coming. Uh, my name is Jim Hopper. I'm the executive director of the Bainbridge Community Foundation in Bainbridge Island, Washington. We are very fortunate to be the community in which uh, Paul Merriman has chosen to, uh, to call home. And um, we're even more thrilled to have him here today um, for, for one of his fantastic presentations. Um, as is our, our custom here at Bainbridge Community Foundation, we start all of our presentations with a land acknowledgement. Um, Chief Seattle said, every part of the soil is sacred in the estimation of my people. Every hillside, every valley, every plain and every grove has been hallowed by some sad or happy event in days long vanished. We begin acknowledging that the land in which we gather here on Bainbridge is within the Aboriginal territory of the Suquamish people, the people of the clear salt water. Expert fishermen, canoe builders, ba and basket weavers, the Suquamish live in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington's Central Salish Sea as they have for thousands of years. Here the Suquamish live and protect the waters of their ancestors for future generations as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. So um, I'd like to uh, start by introducing Paul Merriman, who I'm sure many of you know. Um, Paul is of course uh, a nationally recognized expert on investing and uh, mutual funds, asset allocation. Uh, he has written um, eight books uh, and um, countless podcasts. Uh, I'm sure many of you follow him um, either through Market Watch or through um, his his uh, podcast, Sound Investing, um, or through one of his newsletters. Um, we are fortunate to have had Paul as a uh, board member here at the Community Foundation, where he. Um, really was an incredible uh, mentor and friend and to uh, both to everyone in the community foundation. So you're here today to um, to hear Paul talk about smart financial steps in your 20s and 30s. Um, and I want to just remind you that if you go to the Bainbridge Community Foundation website at bainbridgecf.org and click over on the left hand uh, menu for news and events, you can find all of uh, the remainder of Paul's presentations. Um, the next presentation that we have is called um, Saving, Investing, and Planning, Getting Ready for Your Third Act. That's where Tom Cock will be joining uh, Paul on April 6th. And then Christine Benz will be joining Paul um, for a presentation called Making, Smart, uh, Making the Smartest Financial Moves in Retirement. And then finally, um, Paul will be on vacation, but I will be uh, here to speak with Mary Beth Franklin about how to maximize Social Security for everyone on April 20th. So again, you can find all of those on our website and you register just as you did with this one. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Paul and with our, our extraordinary gratitude. This is, um, gosh, Paul, I'm not even sure how many years the, the financial education series has been going on, but it's been, it was a, I think it's eight. I think it's eight. eight. Yeah. And um, we are just tremendously grateful. The resources that Paul has been been able to share with you and others in, in the our community and the broader community have been really invaluable. So we're very grateful for you, Paul. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. That's very kind. And awesome. certainly we are we are grateful for the fine and wonderful work that the community foundation does. Uh, this community, I, I just think is amazing. I, I spoke recently to the senior center and uh, I look up to see uh, where it might be noting what I was doing. I could not believe all the things going on at our senior community center. Uh, this is just a, a remarkable community and I, I do feel blessed to, to live here. Uh, I am always excited about helping investors learn more about investing. Uh, I am always extra excited if I can get at helping an investor at a younger age. The earlier, the better in terms of taking advantage of the leverage of time. Uh, and as I thought about what could I talk about in the 45 minutes to an hour before the Q&A session, uh, I, I really wanted to focus on those things that I believe are going to be life changers to these young people. And the one area, and the area that my life really focuses on in terms of financial education, 
is on the area of investing. And there is no question in my mind that with careful, prudent steps, not having ever to do anything unusual, staying within the guardrails, staying the course and all those good things that we know makes a more successful investor. Uh, I, I think that the path is relatively easy and that is what our, our financial education is focused on, helping the do-it-yourself investor. I think that's important because people who are relying on somebody else to do everything for them, they don't need to know all of this information. But I do think if you're a do-it-yourself investor, you're sitting there at the table and across from you is your client. And that client is you. And so you have to find out about that client and you hope that client gives you good solid answers to your questions so that you can give them the advice. I mean, this is tricky business trying to be your own advisor. But I do believe that if you get the data, if you get the evidence that shows how investing works, I think that there's a good chance that you can be a great do-it-yourself advisor and client. I do think for young people, it is really important to give perspective to the process of investing. And by the way, uh, at 79, I, I think being in the 30s is young. But I, I find even 30-year-olds don't necessarily get it as to how investing works in their best interest. And I have tried to think of it and describe it to young people as starting a business. I've started businesses. You put a little bit of money in. You work your tail off. And uh, if you stay at it over time, a business can grow. And it is no different with being an investor. And so as you establish the business, you are the boss. You are the president. Uh, you are the general manager. And you have partners in your business. And what you need to understand as an investor who has this business that it is the early days of that business that is going to make the difference as to success or failure. Because what you do in building the foundation of that business will create the long-term success. Now later, your partners are gonna kick in and they're gonna make you tons of money. And you're gonna get up in the morning and you're gonna have a portfolio of mutual funds and companies within the mutual funds and you have millions of people going to work for you in your business. And it truly, that is the way that it does work. You don't have much power over each one of those people, but you are a proportional shareholder in whatever you have in that corporation. Now, the question is, how do you become a really good investor? And I think the key is to start by following the math, following the numbers. When we follow the math, there's a word I can use that I cannot use if we're talking about investing per se. If we follow the math, I can use the word guaranteed because I'm not talking about owning any particular investment. I'm only talking about the math of investing. And let me give you an example of that. Let's say that you are just starting out. And by the way, lots of people are just starting out in their 30s and their 40s. So, so this doesn't mean that you have to be in your teens or in your 20s to be just starting out. But as we start out, let's say that we find an investment that is built to make an 8% compound rate of return for the next 40 years. And I'll talk about such an investment in just a few minutes. And let's say that during that 40-year period, you got the 8%, and then you retired, and for 30 years, you took money out of that investment pool. You took out 4% a year, and you made six because you didn't want to take as much risk in retirement as you did when you were accumulating money. 
And at an 8% compound rate of return, what we know is if you put away $6,000 a year, that your $240,000 that you put in over 40 years would grow at age 65 to $1.7 million. Then you start taking the money to live on. And in fact, if you live for 30 more years, taking out 4%, you will, making 6% in the, in the uh, portfolio, have taken distributions of $2.6 million. And during the period of time or at the end of your life, you will then leave something to your heirs, charities, or children, $2.8 million. Now, from my viewpoint, the profit on all of your investing for your retirement and, and, and how, how you did is reflected in how much you lived on and how much you left. And for that effort, given this math, you would have had about $5.5 million in money spent and money left. Now, here is what I want young investors to understand. If we could just find another one half of 1%. And instead of making eight, make eight and a half during the 40 years of accumulation, instead of making six, make six and a half. And I will share a number of ways that I think you can make an extra half a percent. But if you did that, I think it's important to understand that the math tells us that instead of making 5.5 million, we will end up making about 7 million because we will have taken withdrawals of 3.2 and our heirs and charities will leave, will be left $3.7 million. That is from a very small additional return. And the fascinating part is that extra half a percent is really easy to come by. What if we double that? What if instead of a half a percent, we make it 1% more? Well, that's simple. I, I, I used to be an investment advisor. I used to charge people 1% to manage their money. If they hadn't hired me, then they could have kept that 1% and they would have made an additional 1%. Now, would they have done the right thing? Well, of course, this is the challenge today. What is the right thing to do? And can you be a successful do-it-yourself investor. But here's what that 1% brings you. It doesn't just double the half a percent. Remember, that was 1.5 million. Doesn't take you just to $3 million extra. It takes you to $3.5 million extra because, because you had more money compounding on top of additional money. That extra money just, it, the, the impact of compound interest, it, it still is, I think, amazing to a lot of people. But now, by having made an extra 1%, and it's really on your, uh, it's, it's up to you to do this, because you're going to need to know what you have to do to make that extra half a percent. I've got some ideas. So here we are. We're at the, the, the third opportunity for you to do something that impacts this output, this, this outcome. And so if you do one more thing, this is not about the market. This is about you building your business. If every year you increase the investment by uh, 3%, so instead of investing the second year $6,000, you invested $6,180, $15 more a month. That just that one step on, on your part as the business owner will take you, if again, we have the 9% and we have the 7%, that will take you now up to a total of uh, $12.4 million and increase now of another 3.5 million dollars. I mean, this is just basic math and the impact of saving a little more each year. So you might think you're done, but you're not done because there's one more really good thing you can do. And that is you can start earlier. If you can, and, and by the way, I can't guarantee that every parent's going to be in a position to be able to help you start earlier, but many of us have taken the step to help our, our children and our grandchildren 
get those iris started as early as possible. My, my new granddaughter, my first granddaughter was born in November. And uh, the, the first thing we did other, other than go and hug her and be happy to have her in the family, but we made a contribution to an account that is there to help fund her IRA when she finally gets there. Now, not everybody can do that, but a lot of times we're in a position that we know someday we're going to leave money to these people. Why not leave it in a way that it gets this huge, gigantic leverage of time and compounding tax-free, which of course is what we're working to, uh, to be able to do for these early accounts. So we're talking now about the difference between starting early at age 25 and waiting five years and starting at age 30. And so the only difference in what these two investors are going to have at age 65 and then at age 95 is what happened in that five years that you put away $6,000 earlier than the other and you increased it 3%. So by the time you got to 30, you were already investing more than the person who's starting at age 30. You got the rhythm, you've got the discipline. And because of that extra five years, and, and, and you, you, you are going to have an extra $4.7 million just because of that extra five years. They'll have 7.8 million, you'll have 12.4. So these decisions about investing, it isn't about picking the best stock, the best mutual fund. It is about arranging your business, taking control, building the discipline to build the, the foundation to make it flower. And flower, it, it will. But now we have to follow the history. We start out by following the, the math, and then we jump into the investing part. Then we look at the history. Then we see what steps we can take as an investor in order to have more money later in life. And by the way, I am absolutely dedicated to the idea that when you are planning your financial future, enough is not enough. I had a wonderful conversation with John Bogle in 2017. I had 90 minutes with him to pepper him with questions about his life and the way what he believed about investing. John Bogle was focused on getting people to have enough, to save, to have enough. I actually believe having been around this industry since the mid-60s and having, having seen so many people that had a plan and they knew what they thought was going to be enough, only to find out that enough was not enough. And so one of the reasons I'm working hard to show people simple steps that they can take to build a bigger portfolio. It is not about having a fancier car or taking a, a longer trip. It is about making sure that as you do this, you, you go through this process of saving and investing and accumulating and, and doing all that you're trying to do to retire and have sufficient money to get along on, that you also prepare for the unexpected, which by the way, most of the, but most of the things we think are unexpected, the actuaries think are actually expected, but that's another story. First thing you run into as an investor is the fork in the road that says stocks versus bonds. Now, I was looking for a half a percent. If you want to find a place to find a half a percent, in fact, if you want to find the, the difference in multiple halves of 1%, the first step is to choose stocks over bonds. And yet 23% of, of, uh, of, of young people, millennials, are not willing to invest in the stock market because it's too risky. It's gambling. It's speculating. It's not prudent, they think. But I want to show you the long-term return for government bonds, whether it be short-term government bonds, 
intermediate or long-term. $100 over the last 95 years has grown to $2,000 to $12,000. That's what we should expect out of bonds, a return that is somewhere between 3 and 5%. At least that's what it's been since 1928. Now, there have been times much higher and much lower, but that's been the compound rate of return. And here's what I know, that if that's one choice, what is the other? Well, the other choice is, if you put $100 into the S&P 500, a portfolio of large companies only, some are growth, some are value, some are hot dogs and growing pretty fast, and they're exciting, and they're a place you want to be, and others are out of favor and not so exciting, but they're still big companies, so they're in this index. And that index has compounded over the last 95 years at 9.8. And that means that it grew the $100 to $750,000. Or if you took the growth out of the portfolio and you held only all the leverage of the, uh, the uh, large cap value companies, it would have been an 11% or almost $2 million. Or if you had a portfolio of smaller companies instead of $100 billion companies, more like $5 billion companies or even less sometimes, that portfolio, that index, that group of stocks compounded at 11.8. And then finally, the, the, the gold ring of, of investing. And, and I'm sorry that I talk so much about the, the small cap value asset class because it isn't normal for people to have much in their portfolios. And I'm just on the, on the hunt to try to convince people that they probably should have some in their portfolio. I will try my best to make the case here today and believe that that will help you having to have more than enough when you need it. And over here, we have the combination of these different equity asset classes. And by the way, I want to make it very clear, nobody's handpicking the best of any of these. They're owning all of the stocks. These studies are uh, as you would in an index fund. So if I'm left with the decision and I'm looking for an extra half of 1%, it seems to me the choice of getting 10% versus getting 5%, there are 10 half a percent differences there. And truly, when you invest $6,000 a year and you increase it by 3% a year, and then you use that mark that 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 uh, investment over a lifetime it is in fact about a 14 million dollar difference between going the route of the stocks versus the bonds about a 14 million dollar difference so what's wrong with stocks what's wrong with them is this thing called losing they lose they lose badly. They, they, in fact, there's one year, calendar year, that the S&P 500 was down over 43%, large cap valued 61, small cap blend 48, small cap value 55. Those years feel terrible. And it just turns out the market loses money about one out of four years. So there's a lot of pain in the process of trying to get the gain that you're hoping to get. And sometimes people just, they, they can't stand the idea of losing money. Well, I can't say guarantee, but I'd love to be able to say guarantee, but I'll tell you what I know about the last 95 years, if you break it up into the 55, 40 year periods, there was never a losing 45, a 40 year period. The average compound rate of return of the S&P 500 of all 55 of these, of, of these periods, that average return was 11%. Large cap value, 13.4. Small cap blend, 13.7. And small cap value, 16.2. The worst, the worst was 8.9. And that's not a loss. That's the worst, the, the worst gain compounded, compounded rate, and about the same for large cap value, and 10.6 for small cap blend, and 11.6 for small cap value. 
the worst 40 year period. So if we're trying to figure out where do we invest our money, that we are going to get the highest return. I think if we are afraid of stocks and choose fixed income bonds, that we are likely going to make almost nothing before inflation, because all of these numbers I just shared with you are not inflation adjusted and have not been taxed. In other words, those returns from the bonds between taxes and inflation are going to leave you with almost no return. Daryl Balls is our director of analytics. He's a volunteer. Chris Patterson, I'll, mean, I'll mention him today, also a volunteer at our foundation. They are both amazing volunteers. Uh, Chris Patterson wrote the book, Two Funds for Life, and created our best in class uh, ETF recommendations. Daryl Balls has put together, we have 200 tables he just finished uh, updating. He actually hasn't finished this one yet, but he's working on them. And I'm going to be sharing a few of his, of his tables. His tables are built as best we can to focus on numbers, but still make them entertaining enough that you'll learn something. Because what is this? This is the returns I've just been talking about one year at a time with the equity asset classes. So if you see a green return, that's the S&P 500. If you see the electric blue, that's the small cap value. If you see the uh, kind of uh, brownish, that small cap blend, and the touch of yellow is large cap value, and the purple, I didn't talk about that, it's the average every year of the four of those equity asset classes. Now, what does that teach us? Well, the first thing that I remember is that the S&P 500 had the worst return. So I would expect the S&P 500 to be kind of at the bottom most of the time. Well, it is about half of the time, almost half of the time at the bottom. But in about a third of the years, it's at the top. In other words, just because it might not be very good at relatively uh, lower returns for the long run, does not mean that, it, that it's going to be there all the time. A lot of the times it's doing fantastic. And small cap value, the gold ring, as I said, of, of asset classes, it spends a lot of time at the bottom. About a third of the time, it's at the bottom. But if I had to pick an investment on this page, that suggests to me that I have the least volatility, that I can count on that investment more or less year after year. No, never going to be number one, never going to be number four or five, but mostly just right in the middle. That is nothing more than the combination of the other four asset classes every year since 1928 through 2019. And I think that tells a couple of amazing stories about volatility, because even though the S&P 500 is theoretically more risky than the four fund strategy, I'm getting the feeling that it is actually the four fund strategy is less risky, that I can, in essence, count on a, a, a better return. In fact, I also know that if I look at the returns over a long period of time of putting these different equity asset classes together, here's the small cap value. There's a 13.4% compound annualized growth rate, the PAGR. Then if I put a portfolio together that was half in large value and half in small, it would have been 12.5. If I used a two fund strategy, by the way, this is what but what we're doing for our granddaughter, that money is going to be half S&P 500 and half in small cap value. That was a 12.2% 
compound rate of return. The four fund strategy that I just said was so marvelous in terms of volatility uh, had a 12%. And here's the S&P 500 down here at 10.2. Now, the thing I, 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 was, I was really anxious for you to do is to get into the stock market rather than having everything in bonds. And I'm, I'm guessing most of the people here with me tonight are, are, are in stocks. How much will be very different, I guess, but have stocks in their portfolio. But the fact that I could find an opportunity to go from 10 to maybe 12 and not take any more risk. Now, there are many, many ways to judge risk. And I will show you another way to judge risk with the S&P 500 and these different combinations of equity asset classes. You wanna be more aggressive? I know how to be more aggressive. Go all value. You wanna be more conservative? Well, I know how to do that, but I don't want you, if you're 20 to 40 years old, to be in equities for the long term. Every 10% you have in fixed income in your portfolio, in the long-term 40-year strategy that you're putting money away, every 10% of fixed income reduces your compound rate of return by about a half a percent. And so uh, I don't want you to give up a half a percent uh, for the next 40, the next 20 years anyway, if you're, if you're in your early 20s. But I really want to encourage young people to be all equities until they get to age 40. Now, I want to show you one more study. Uh, I think Tom Cock, if, now Tom's going to be speaking to a different group of people. He's going to be speaking to people from 40 to 65. They have some different kinds of investment challenges. You know, we're pedal to the metal in a sense here. I'm not encouraging people to be all individual equity, buying individual company stock. I'm not trying to do that. I'm talking about diversified portfolios. But we have done a lot of work over the years. In fact, this table goes back to the mid 90s that I started working on this project. And what it did was it simply made the case for diversification of different equity asset classes. I want to do this quickly. I showed, starting way back then, starting with $100,000 in 1970. What did it grow to through the mid 90s? Well, now we're looking to what it grew to through 2022. And it would have grown to about $19 million, not adding any money, not taking any money out, not paying any taxes, but paying a minor fee, a minor fee to be in it, almost like a regular index fund or an ETF. And then what we did to make the case, we one by one started adding individual equity asset classes. We added Large cap value, 10%. The return went up to 20.8 million. We added 10% small cap blend. The return went up to 22 million. We added 10% small cap value. The return went up to 27 million. We added 10% in REITs, real estate investment trust. It went up to 27,600. Now that's not a big deal compared to the others but it helped keep the volatility down. The REITs have about the same long-term return as the S&P 500, but they don't go up and down together all the time. And then in one fell swoop, we added 10% of four international equity asset classes. A large value, large blend, small blend, small value. Then it got up to 35 million and finally we had 10% in emerging markets, and it gets up to $41 million using just the asset class returns. Nobody trying to do any better than own an index. And the point is not that, that you have to own 10 of them. The point is 
is that it isn't just about diversifying amongst different, different stocks. You got 500 companies in the S&P 500. And by the way, those 500 companies are not the same today as they were in 1970. Every decade, they replace and change about 200 of them. It's an actively managed index. And you can't buy that return, but we can buy the equity asset classes. And all the academic research shows that it is equally important to have diversification among asset classes. Now you may not wanna get beyond the, beyond the 10. There are two funds that you have a very good opportunity to make a 10% compound rate of return. It's been, they've been turned inside out going all the way back to 1928. They are the S&P 500 and they are the total market index. And so, those two, by the way, have almost exactly the same return. The S&P 500 has out-earned the total market index by one-tenth of 1% 1 a year. Now, there are cases here where the difference between one and the next was only one-tenth of 1%, 1 like from portfolio two to portfolio three, or from portfolio four to portfolio five. So even one-tenth of 1% 1 can be important over long periods of time. And if I'm talking to some 20s and 30-somethings here tonight, I hope there are some here, then 53 years is part of your life. In fact, you're probably, which is what this table is about, you're probably going to be along around for more than 53 years. All right. All I'm saying is, is that you can have more than one major equity asset class in your portfolio. And I believe if you do that intelligently, and I'm going to show you ever so briefly how to do it intelligently. Now, when I say how to do it intelligently, I have not stamped the word guarantee on anything, okay? Because I can't guarantee anything about the future. I can say that the academics will tell us the more diversification that you have, the lower the risk. So if you are combining different asset classes, and if those asset classes don't go up and down together all the time, again, you have an advantage. So now I want to look at a handful of portfolios that we've developed. And we tell you exactly the funds at Vanguard, at Fidelity, at T. Rowe Price. And we show the best in class ETFs or ETFs. You can use it. If you want to use the Vanguard ETFs, you can use those. Or if you want to use what we consider to be better than the Vanguard, but you can buy them at Vanguard, you can use those. But we have built these portfolios and we show people the long-term results. We show them the risk, we show them the return. All I want to do here is to show you in table A2, here we are with $19 million in the S&P 500. Here's 41 in the ultimate buy and hold. If you just own four funds, two US, two international, one of them a large cap blend, one of them a large cap value, one of them a small cap blend, one of them a small cap value, and we tell you exactly the funds we think you ought to be in, you would have made a little bit more and only have to deal with four funds instead of 10. Or if you didn't want to go uh, and, and take the risk of internationals, if you see that the homegrown are more uh, comfortable for you, okay, do the same thing with a four fund strategy, it's still a balance of large, and small and value and growth. And the, and, and the total value at the end of the 53 years, almost the same, 41,500,000. If you wanna really take more risk, then you could take the worldwide all value. Throw out the growth, throw out the great companies and, and be left with the more conservative 
As a matter of fact, if you go to Vanguard and look at the large cap value companies, you'll recognize them. In fact, the number one company in that large cap value group is Berkshire Hathaway. And you've got the you've got oil companies in there, and you've got Procter and Gamble. You've got a lot of great companies. And finally, over here, I'll take you right to the last one at 46.6 million. That is half in the S&P 500 and half in small cap value. And why did I pick that? Even though it has a lower rate of return, 12.3, lower than I could have gotten for, we could have gotten theoretically for our granddaughter at 13. Why would I take this lower return? Because half of it is in this benchmark index that people just love. People think is that Warren Buffett, as a matter of fact, even says the only investment you ever need to make is the S&P 500. And when he dies, he has asked the trustees to put 90% of the money he has for his wife into the S&P 500 and the other 10% into T-bills. So I want when our granddaughter is 18 and she finds out about this account and money is going into a Roth IRA because hopefully she's, she's, she's working a little bit and we can put some money into the Roth IRA as she starts working, I want her to be able to see the return of those two asset classes. I want her to see the difference year after year. I'm going to show you in a few minutes how different those returns can be. And to see also that there were long periods that the S&P 500 did well and other periods small cap value did well. It will be such a wonderful lesson, real time, real time. So the big risk, the big problem is dealing with loss. We don't wanna take the loss of the market. This is a wonderful graphic that shows since 1926, uh, the good times, the bull markets, and the bear markets. The red, those are the bear markets. And with each bear market, it tells you how long it lasted from, from uh, when it qualified as a bear market and until it was replaced by another bull market. And I'll tell you, when you are going down, I don't care if it's four months or for two years, it it just feels terrible because it feels like you're going to go down forever. But you can see it hasn't been forever. And by the way, the bull markets aren't forever either. But boy, I mean, look at here, this one that uh, ended in 1964 after 181 months, one that ended in 1989 uh, that ended uh, at 155 months, one that ended uh, in uh, 2000 after 155 months. And then we got hit with a couple of years where we, we had really in three years, we had two bear markets. And then the market took off again. And then, I mean, this is the history of investing. And remember the company that we're building, if we build it and it has the S&P 500, and it has the large cap value and the small cap value and the small cap blend, you have got so much diversification. It does not protect you against the com complete collapse. We had a complete collapse uh, in, in the 30s uh, of the stock market. But what a lot of us may not know is the stock market for the whole 10 years ending 19. 38, from 29 to 38, the compound rate of return, which was not a return, but it was a loss. Well, the return was a loss, was a lower loss than was sustained in the 2000 through 2009 bear market. That 10 years was a negative 1%. As a matter of fact, if you look at the, the return inflation adjusted from 1929 to 
1938, it was actually profitable because it was a period of deflation. So what I would love for you to do is to build a portfolio. And, and, and that conversation I just had about the, the, what we call the ultimate buy and hold strategy, those 10 different funds, uh, I just completed. Uh, you, you can go online and you, you can see a, about a one hour video just on that, uh, on that one topic. But if you are not gonna build your own portfolio, what I would love you to consider is to use a target date fund. It is truly the number one retirement investment in America today. And I'm talking about if you're in your 20s and 30s, you're putting money into a 401k, you have almost always going to have a target date fund available to you. And the target date fund does something that no other investment does. And that is, it allows you to make one decision, whether you're 21 or 31 or 41 or even 51. You can say when you want to retire. And they will know. They will know how old you are, and they will know how aggressive you should be. Now, you can outfox them. You could be a 51-year-old investor and tell them you want to re uh, retire in 2065, in which case you'd have a portfolio that's only 10% in bonds. You can outfox them if you want to. But I'm not recommending you outfox them, although I will make a recommendation that I truly think is going to be life-changing regarding the use of a target date fund. But the target date fund has people, the same kind of people who run pension funds. I mean, they, this is serious conservative money. They do not get aggressive. I wish they did. I'm going to show you how. But it's very conservative. But here is the wonderful thing about these portfolios. Number one, they automatically adjust the amount of equity and fixed income over your life. So even if you retired at age 65, you could still keep them on your payroll working for you because they know how old you are and they will continue to add more fixed income as you get older. Now, I'm 79. If I had a target date fund at Vanguard, they would have me 30% in equities, 70% in fixed income. No way for me. My wife and I have oversaved, and so we feel we can take the risk of 50-50 instead of 70-30 or 30-70. But to have no responsibility for what to do with that money, but have it managed professionally for the rest of your life. If you don't know what you're doing, this is what you should be doing. You have a friend that doesn't know what they're doing. They're gonna, they're, they're gonna you, you should tell them that's what they should do. Now understand, target date funds have problems too. Everything has problems. That's the, it, can't, it can't be what everybody needs. And one of the problems that, oh, I've got to make sure I mention this 2.3% down here. This is a million dollar thing to know. The people at Wharton Business School, so a, a, a project, work together uh, with, with Vanguard. They looked at 1.2 million Vanguard accounts that were in 401ks that were in target date funds or not. So they could see how the people who were not were invested compared to the ones in target date funds. Now with the target date funds, everybody's got the same thing. So it doesn't mean that all the people who were not in target date funds uh, are, are, are going to have the same thing based on whatever age they are. But here's what they found out. That the people who didn't use target date funds, who made all the decisions themselves, 
They had way too little money in equities for the age. They had tons of cash in their account sitting there doing nothing. And they were market timing. And the end result was they were based on what they were doing, designing portfolios to make 2.3% less per year than you get in a target date fund. So if you know anybody that doesn't know what to do and you want them to do the right thing, I really would recommend the target date fund. It is true. It drives me nuts. They've got 10% in bonds for a 20-year-old. And the reason that they do that is they just want to train people to understand that a target date fund is there to have to take care of the bonds and the stocks. So instead of waiting until 40, when is the next time that the, the target date fund adds any, any, any bonds, instead of waiting until then, they hang on to this 10% piece for, for 20 years, maybe. So too much in bonds, too little in value, and too little in small cap. They are driven by funds like the S&P 500. Actually, the Vanguard funds are a combination of the total market US and the total market international. Large cap growth driven. And it's not that that's bad it just isn't likely to give the return of a more broadly diversified portfolio. And Chris Pedersen came up with a solution. And I'll be offering a free book you can get online uh, that he wrote. And what he suggests, several approaches. One is, let's say you're saving 10% in a target date fund. All he recommends you do to make a difference is to add, let's say you're, you're putting in a uh, dollar, uh, put 90 cents into the target date fund and 10 cents into the small cap value or 80, 80% 80 uh, into the target date fund and 20% into the uh, a small cap value, or even 30%. And I'm going to show you why in just a few minutes. And all you do then is you just carry on your, your 90 10. You don't have to rebalance. You don't have to do anything. You will, if, if you start doing this and you do this for 10 or 15 or 20 years, you're going to get to know your, your employees, your partners very well. And you'll know the times that you're disappointed and the times that you're very enthusiastic for them. But that 10% could legitimately uh, add an extra half to 1% over a lifetime. And of course, it even gets better if you go to 20%. Uh, he has in that book another portfolio that I just think is marvelous. Basically, you take your age you, you multiply your age by one and a half, and that's the you're, you're basically the, the, the portion that the one and a half is, that would be, if you're 20, that would be eight years old, that'd be 30. You have that amount in the target date fund, the rest is in small cap value. And as you get older, that 1.5 times your older age will, will have you owning more and more target date funds. For those of you who are interested, uh, that book covers it. And by the way, the second half of We're Talking Millions is focused on that same subject. That is also available free. I put this in at the last minute. Uh, this is, is one of the most interesting tables that Daryl has ever done. Uh, I can't see the exact top, but you can, I hope. And by the way, I'm not going to ask you to be able to see all these numbers. I'm going to show you the bottom line in a few minutes. But here's what this table represents from 30,000 feet. On the far left, one year at a time, the return of the S&P 500. On the far right, the return of the S&P 500, one year at a time, without any fees. In the 
column right next to the S&P 500 on the right is small cap value one year at a time since 1970. There is nothing magic here. This is a whole bunch of years. Some years are great for one and not for the other. Uh, I can see 1977, S&P 500 was down 7.2. Small cap value was up 22.2. I can see 2000 through 2002. And the S&P was down three years in a row. Small cap value only had a loss one year. By the way, the reason that happened partially is the previous five years, the S&P 500 was amazing and small cap value wasn't. So it's not like, like a small cap value just wiped out the S&P 500. These are different asset classes. They don't go up and down all the time at the same time or by the same amount. In fact, every year, the average difference in return is about 14%. So if one makes 10, the other one has probably made 24 or maybe lost 4%. But what I want you to see that's so valuable here, and that is the bottom of this chart. I want you to see that if you were in the S&P 500 itself only, with an annualized return of 10.4, and a standard deviation, a volatility rating. Higher numbers mean a little more risky. For example, over here we have a 17.8. That would be a little more risky, but not much. But let me talk about under the S&P 500. The worst six months was a loss of 41.8%. The worst 12 months, a loss of 43.3. This is going back to 1970. The worst drawdown from a peak to a valley before it came back up to the peak was a 51% loss. Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch have both been quoted as saying, if you're not willing to lose half of your money, you shouldn't be in the stock market but they're talking about for a short period of time, not forever. I know how to lose half of your money forever. Invest in Enron, invest in the uh, Washington Mutual. It's easy to do. Virtually half of the public companies since 1926 have either gone bankrupt or either were sold, merged away, and, and on average didn't make more than 3%. I mean, there are a lot of companies that don't make it, but we're not looking at trying to own just the good ones because you can't own just the good ones. We want to own them all knowing some of them will be dogs. This includes the dogs, by the way. Enron was in the S&P 500. Look what happens when you add 10% small cap value to the 100% S&P 500. Standard deviation is still the same. You remember, they don't go up and down together. So that helps keep the standard deviation down. It added four tenths of 1%. And yes, you had to accept a little more risk, a little more loss. Instead of the worst year being 43.3, it's 43.9. And I know you're not thinking, ooh, I don't think I could take that. I can take the 43.3, but I don't think I can take the 43.9. Of course you will, if you'll take the 43.3. And if you believe you shouldn't be market timing and jumping out of the market when it's down. Okay. And by the way, the worst drawdown was six-tenths of 1% more. If you added 20%, it takes your worst 12 months to 44.5, a little bit more than 1% down, one time. And the worst drawdown was a little bit larger. And finally, finally, if you went out 30, 30%, 30 
it takes your standard deviation to 17.4. That is virtually the same. You would not feel the difference because it was that three-tenths of 1%. The worst 12 months, yes, is a little more. The worst drawdown, instead of 51 now, is 53.5. But you have just picked up a more than 1%. That is a big deal. That is a huge deal. And not only will I hope you do, I hope your kids will. That's the whole idea to share this. Now, for my our granddaughter, I like the 50-50. I think that's a, it, it, it means there's gonna be a drawdown of about 55.8, more probably, who knows? And the worst 12 months was 3% more. But she will have picked up almost 2% more compound rate of return. And if I, of course, I'm not going to be there when she's 18. But I, but I will try to, through, through a podcast to her, a recording, and a letter, convince her just this particular investment. Keep it all equity as your whole life. Uh, the, the implications of that, and get it into your to your Roth IRA as soon as possible. The implications of that are not only will she be able to spend a lot of money, but she also should be able to leave money to things she cares about. And Jim, it might not be Bainbridge Community Foundation. I don't see her living on Bainbridge, so. But it's it be some community. Don't, don't sell her short there, Paul. <laughs> okay. Oh, you want to make an extra half percent, lower the expenses of your mutual funds. The average equity mutual funds around 0.8. You, you can get into a, a, an index fund or 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 other ETF funds for 0.1. You can you can save 90 basis points, 90 one hundredths of one percent by using a, a lower expense fund. Be in a fund that has lower taxes. A lot of people don't know in actively managed funds, Morningstar tracks the tax efficiency of actively managed funds. There's about a 1% higher cost in return to actively managed funds because of taxes. And you can go, you can go track that. You can look at your actively managed funds and see how much the what is the tax implication of that actively managed fund. And trust, and of course, buy index funds. That gives you low expenses, it gives you low taxes because there's low turnover, and it gives you massive diversification. And buy and hold. I know market, I've been following market timing since 1966. I know market timing inside and out, and I have talked to thousands of people who have tried market timing. Market timing is the most difficult thing to deal with because once people use what I call the ICSIA market timing strategy, I can't stand it anymore. They got out of the market in either late 2007, early 2008, and many of them are still trying to figure out how to get back in. One bad market call. Getting out when you think the world's coming to an end. About the time you think the market's coming to an end, more than likely, more than likely, it's a very close to the bottom. One of the biggest challenges to be a good investor, to, to run a really good business of investing, is to realize that this is not about events. This process is not about events. If you are a buy and hold investor, you are not supposed to be responding to events. You are in it for the long term journey. That's what long-term investing is about. And with that in mind, 
every time you see what the press, what TV, what they're pushing, they're pushing events, inflation, politically, political uproar. Uh, go watch Jim Cramer on TV, and he talks about the earnings. Re an earnings report is an event. It has nothing to do with the next 40 years. Or by the way, if you're in your 20 or 20s or 30s, we're talking about doing this for maybe 60 years or more. It's the long journey. And it takes discipline to buy and hold. And every 10% you add in equities. If you're a fixed income person, every 10% you add is going to add about uh, half a percent. And of course, I'm hoping, as you can tell, you'll add some small and some value. I'm going to check my time. How bad have I been? Well, I guess I'm okay. Um, IRAs and 401k. Now, see, anything else I talk about is not going to have the impact that I just talked about regarding these decisions you're going to make about your business, your investing business. But there are some things you can fine tune and make a little better. For example, if you work for a company that has a 401k and it has not matching anything and it has lousy investment options, and if you don't know if there are lousy investment options, it's okay if you ask me, paul at paulmerriman.com. I mean, it takes just a second to see if they're lousy options. Now, whether I'll tell you exactly which options you should use uh, depends how much time I have, but I will tell you that if you follow our work on the internet, you will know what options you should be using. So uh, that's part of this process we're trying to go through here is introduce you to these, these, these asset classes. But if you don't have good 401k choices, you're better off going to an IRA. In fact, you may not have a Roth 401k inside a, um, your 401k plan. And definitely, if they're not matching, you'd want to go use the Roth IRA uh, on your own because you'll have, you'll have access to all the different equity asset classes, all the ETFs all the indexes at low cost and broad diversity. I mean, you can do all the right things. And you can use a target date fund, by the way, with a, with a small cap value inside of an IRA if you want. But of course, after you do that $6,500, you're going to have to go hold your nose and start putting more money in the 401k. Now, I take a little different approach. And... Uh, there are a few sources I'm going to give you. On our website, we have a page called Truth Tellers. They are sources of information I trust. I do not get paid anything from any of these people. I do not get paid anything from the foundation. When I retired, I promised my wife I would never work for money again, and I've kept that promise. But I will, I, I, I will tell you that, oh, you know something? I normally warn people this could happen during the presentation. I forgot to warn you. At 79, from time to time, my mind does this thing where it, what is it called? Forgets. And so I, 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 I lost the path there for a second. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The Roth. Why the Roth? When you put money into a Roth, you are not getting a refund. And you are getting lifetime tax-free growth and lifetime tax-free income. That is golden. And when you are young, you're not in a very high tax bracket anyway. And when you do a regular IRA, then what you typically do is you get that refund because you did it and you spend it on something that's fun. Now, I'm not trying to ruin your fun. I'm just saying that when you put money into a Roth IRA, you are, in essence, investing more money. 
and you're getting it in there to be protected from taxes. And I can tell you that when I came into this industry in 1966, the highest marginal tax rate was 70%. The year before, it was 90%. And who knows what taxes will be in the future. Now, back to the 401k. You got a match going on in your company? You got to get, you got to find the money somewhere. You've got to find the money to take advantage of that 401k match. See, it's not just the match. It's that you're also probably really young. I would have no hesitancy. Uh, um, I mean, my kids, my, my younger kids knew that I had done this for my older kids. So they knew that I was committed to, to doing this for them. But I, there are a lot of parents that they just might not think that this is a better way to leave you money. Don't forget those first five years. And so not only by doing that match, are you getting your money in there? But you are getting the, you're doubling, you may be getting twice as much but from the match. There are companies that literally match dollar for dollar. Some it's up to 10%, some five, some three. But I don't want you to miss that match. I know people, there's a thing called a fire movement. It's, it's financial independence, retire early. I can't say there are millions of people in the movement, but I can tell you there are hundreds of thousands. And these are people who are trying to retire early. And they're saving money big time, percentage-wise. I know some that save 70%. I know people that are working a couple of jobs, not because they needed to get by on, but because they need that extra money to fund these things early on to take advantage of that first five years. So... Um, and then, of course, there's the, the triple tax treat, the triple tax free health savings account. Now, I'm going to have you go somewhere else. I'm not going to spend the time to talk about it, but it allows you uh, the tax deductibility, the tax free uh, growth, and the tax free distributions with the money being used to pay for health expenses uh, in your life. And by the way, once you start investing in the taxable accounts, I want you for sure to be investing in something like the S&P 500 uh, in particular or ETFs where they're very tax efficient. ETFs are much more tax efficient than regular mutual funds. Here are the truth tellers. I tell you, you come up with almost any question about investing and they will have uh, at, at the balance, an article that is not only written by professionals, but is, is, is peer reviewed. And if you don't get what you want there, go to the White Coat Investor. And if you want me to recommend a book that will address most of the questions you'll ever come up with, my expertise is really about investing. I'm not a tax guy. I'm not an insurance guy. I'm an investment person. But there are lots of other things that you'll want to get into. And that book, Your Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement, is just terrific. And it's available as, as a paperback. And if you want to read somebody's work, Larry Swedro is one of our, our truth tellers. Here are the two books that are free. And uh, you've got a PDF. I think if you go to your PDF that you got, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you can go right to the place on our site where you can get the order the free uh, PDF. And we make this, both of these books are free for a reason. What we want you to do, one is read the book and say, hey, that's really good information. Then I want you to send it because it, you'll have it in a P PDF format to send it to other people that you might think will benefit. At age 79, I got a lot of goals. In fact, I've got a bucket list. It may not be the kind of bucket list you have, but on my bucket list is I want to speak at the Bogleheads conference before I die. The good news is I just got invited to speak there. I have got some things I want to accomplish 
before I end the work that I'm doing. I want this little book, and it's a short read. I want it in the hands of a million youngish people in their 20s and their 30s. By the way, anybody can use it. And the two funds for life, there's also a part about two funds for life when you're retired in this book. And the fellow that wrote it uh, is, is one of the smartest people I've worked around, one of the nicest people, and both Daryl Balls and, 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 and Chris Pedersen. And one more name I've got to mention, uh, uh, Craig. Uh, Craig Apple, uh, he created a, uh, a calculator so that he could take our numbers, our 200, our 200 tables that we have, and put them on a computer where people can use them in, in a calculator format. So you can, you can not only, can you put your own numbers in there, how much you have to invest, how much you have in, in your portfolio, but you can also trick the computer and you can say, you know, I like those numbers from the last uh, 52 years. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'd love it if I could get that return again, but I'm gonna take a, a percent and a quarter off of all the returns that are in the calculator, in the database. Oh, I'm gonna take 2% off. I'm gonna take a half a percent off. You tell it what you want to take off and it will do that for you. Uh, these are all volunteer helpers with, uh, with our organization. And there's my email address. I'm easily reachable. And uh, uh, I think most of you, hopefully, who are here have not found it too difficult to get a hold of me. Uh, I hope this has been helpful. Now, Jim, do we have a few minutes, a few minutes for questions? Uh, indeed, we do, Paul. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Paul, I'm going to start out with my own. So if you want to go ahead and close your um, I will presentation, we and we can be right on the screen. I am so sorry that I did that to you. Well, that's okay. We're all good. Um, all right, Paul. So I'm going to tell you the story of two brothers grew up on a farm in Caldwell, Idaho, um, both of whom uh, in their 20s were working. One was in for-profit uh, organ for-profit companies. He was actually an Enron employee. Um, the other was uh, working in nonprofits. Uh, the they would both go on to be CEOs of respective organ of their respective organization of organizations uh, respectively but um, for one he for the for the for-profit he in his 20s received a tremendous amount of um, of corporate stock from the from his employer and of course the the going sort of pressure is you know you hang on to that and and um, you believe in the company that you're a part of uh, the other that worked for nonprofits felt like, gosh, you know, I don't think I make enough money yet to start investing. I need to spend all of my money right now on my house, on my car, on whatever it is that that is my my basic uh, living expense. <clears throat> so I asked that question. So I'd, I'd love, you know, I think I think a lot of people in their 20s find themselves in in one of those two camps. And I'd love your thoughts on how do you keep your head in either of those situations. In one situation, you have a lot of money on, on paper. You look like you are doing really, really well. In yep. the other situation, you don't feel like you're ever going to have enough money to start to invest. And frankly, when you, when you hear wonderful presentations like yours, mm -hmm. where people say like, start early, that you know it's panic inducing, right? Well, first of all, you could start with very little. I mean, literally, you could start with $100. You could go to, 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 to Fidelity. You, you could, we have a, a, a right, these recommended portfolios, and we recommend ETFs. And you could go to Fidelity, and you could buy those ETFs. Let's say you wanted to buy all four of those ETFs, a little bit in those big, small value, all that. You could divide your $100 into four parts, and you would be able to buy portions of four funds so that you had a $100 portfolio, completely diversified, and there was no commission to buy. When you go to sell, there's no commission to sell, and the internal expenses inside of those ETFs 
are very, very low, less than uh, less than one tenth of one percent. I'm going to guess. Uh, now, so you can start with a little. The other thing that you can do, and th this obviously is not easy for everybody to do, but some people are so driven to saving that they will work a second job in order just to earn that money that it takes to meet whatever that you want to put aside. Uh, so, so that's also another possibility. But let me tell you something that's happened in our society. We, have, we now count on a 401k that we put the money in. Yes, some companies match, but the real, the heavy lifting is left to us. And we are also left with the heavy lifting of, uh, of, of having to decide what investments that we're going to make. And, and, and so uh, the problem is, is that right out of the gate, we're behind the eight ball because even if we can say we're not sure what to do. So what happened was companies gave people a, a legitimate offer. They would allow them to, to opt in automatically to the retirement account. And a very small number of people would sign up for the retirement account. And then they changed. Instead of requiring people to opt in, they automatically signed them up and they became part of the program and they had to opt out. And 83% of the people stayed in. Yeah. And it's, it, it is a mindset. I know in, in watching what these doctors are doing who are part of this uh, white coat investor group that I spoke with, I had four days there where I was talking to these people about how they feel about investing in and how they treat their money. These people are being encouraged after they become a doctor to continue to live like a resident. And a lot of them are doing that exact thing. They're learning to live financially like they were a resident. So I know this is a, a mindset. And I know that there is the possibility of saving, but it means a, a dedication that for a lot of people doesn't even feel good. I, I'm just thinking about this guy who's the nonprofit guy. You know, when you're in the nonprofit industry, generally you're not about money. Right. When you're in the, in the, in the broker's business, in the money business, you are about money. That's all you're about. And, 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 and so I could see where somebody would say, I'm not going to do that. I got a life. I love what I do. And I'm not going to do stuff I don't want to do. Well, I know a man who was a nonprofit guy. And what he did, he quit being a nonprofit guy for five years. And he went out and worked doing things he didn't want to do. And he saved like mad during that five years. And then after he worked for five years and saved like mad, he went back to what he was doing before, but he had put aside enough money that over the years that he would now be working for very little, that he could build his retirement. Now he still has to invest it properly, uh -huh. but yes, there are answers. The problem is, is that it is really hard to have that discipline if you don't have that kind of a mindset. Yeah. And um, how about the flip side? How about the one that's that's got lots of money, but it's all in his, and it, it, it's all it's not diversified. It's all in his own employer stock. How does what, well, what the mindset biggest, do you recommend uh, that person have in order to, uh, you know, they they at the time, as you can imagine, don't feel like they're ever going to lose. Well, and I thought I heard you mention Enron for a second there. I did yeah, um, uh, and Enron employees generally were told they should be putting all their money in their four hundred one k into Enron stock. I wonder who that was benefiting. Right, right. So, so here's the problem. If you don't understand the emotional side of investing, you may never beat it. One of the reasons I'm trying to get this thing on automatic for people 
that's why I love the target date fund, is, is, is because the less you have to think about this, the better off you are. There's a wonderful book entitled Your Money and Your Brain by Jason Zweig. I've probably read it seven times. And I only do that because, uh, because it is, it's all about the psychological side of money. And one of the things that we know about ourselves or the, or the psychologists know about us is they know that we are overconfident. That's our nature. Now, not everybody is. People who are depressed generally aren't. In fact, people who are depressed, it's in the book, make better investors <laughs> because they don't believe. There's, there's a book called Learned Optimism by I think uh, Gerald Seligman, I believe. Uh, he talks about successful salespeople. The reason they're so successful is because they're so optimistic, but they're looking at life through rose colored glasses. That's not the last person I want trying to help me because somebody's selling them and then they're turning around with those same rose colored glasses and a commission at the end of the month selling a product. I'd rather have you learn how to use index funds and, 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 and make it an automate it. But that overconfidence could lead somebody to believing that US is the only place you have to invest or my company is the only place I have to invest. When I sold out my, my investment advisory firm 12 years ago or in 2012, uh, I knew I wouldn't make as much money, but it was time to pass the baton of risk to other people. Uh, that company is continuing. Merriman Wealth Management is, uh, in fact, I think next week I go to our 40th year anniversary, mm -hmm. and I can't wait. It's going to be great fun. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll probably get a new mug, but but what I what I what I do know is is that uh, these psychological uh, aspects. That's the reason most people need an advisor. They can't beat the psychological problems. We had a couple came into our office one day, retired airline pilot. This is this is back in like 1999, and um, his wife was his wife was with him, and he had he had retired. He had all of his money in high tech stocks in 1999, and all of his money, his in, in, in complete retirement. From the, from the airline. He had rolled it over into high-tech stocks in 1999. And, his, and, his, and, his, and he left to use the bathroom. And his wife literally broke down crying. She had never told him she was scared to death because it was his job to take care of, of the money. And he was being overly optimistic because not only are people optimistic, but we think literally. And when we think literally, we have recency bias. And when we have recency bias, what's been doing well, we think is going to continue to do well. And it doesn't work that way. As people found out, after from 95 to 99, the S&P 500 compounded at 28.5%. And for the next 10 years, it loses 1% a year. And so that, that being overly optimistic, having recency bias, all of these things can, 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 can trip us up. And wishing stuff would work does not, does not work. It's very common. Another, another emotional thing people do, Jim, is the market's been up and it goes down and, and things go way up. And then the, the bear market comes, down, comes along and they go down. And people just assume they're going to, that when the market goes up the next time, the stuff that's way down is going to go up. And that's a bad assumption. And most of the things that people believe work are not right. The myths of investing, there are over 200 of them. And the things that work are not offensive. The things that work are defensive. Uh, owning a thousand stocks is defense against owning one. Low expenses, defense. 
low turnover, low taxes, defense, having fixed income in the portfolio to, to match your risk tolerance, defense, putting it on, on automatic, defense, having an investment advisor, defense. And people think of investing as being something aggressive, offensive. And that's the wrong attitude because your, your, your emotions are going to tend to trick you. That's why people trying to market time it, market time, they don't have a they don't have a shot being a market timer because you got to know how to take a loss. You got to know how to take five losses in a row. Who's going to do that? So read your money and your brain. Yes. Um, Paul, we are we're out of time. Um, there's going to be a couple of folks that I'm I'm recommending um, reach out to you by email with their Great. with individual questions. Um, uh, for everyone else, uh, I just want to thank you all so much for joining us, and again, thank Paul for um, for his terrific advice and recommendations. And um, please do visit our website, BainbridgeCF.org, and look in the the news and events section over on the left hand side for information about um, the future presentations. And may I just say one thing? I saw Christine Benz's presentation in Phoenix a few weeks ago, and I said, please just do that presentation for our folks and they will love it. I guarantee you will enjoy it. It is terrific. Okay, thank you so thanks. much. Bye-bye now. And thanks to everybody. Everybody.